Hello. Now I want to read uh, from Psalm 103, 6 to 18. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Now here, the Holy Spirit, through David, is talking about Israel, but it is not a stretch, considering what we're told in the New Testament, for this to apply to his church as well. We know that human beings have a problem, and that problem is our heart, our mind, our thoughts, our desires, and our spirit. I want to repeat some things um, I, I've said in a sermon on why the good must be saved and why the bad can be saved. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The human heart is not just evil. It is desperately wicked. Do you know what that means? This is going to trouble some of you because you don't look at yourselves this way. If you chance to be out walking and happened upon a nightclub fire like some of the famous ones we've had in past days, say the Coconut Grove Fire in Boston in 1942 during World War II, where in 15 minutes 492 people died and 166 people were injured, you'd see what desperate means. People crowded the exits and would have pulled anyone trying to get out or trying to pull them out to their death in total panic. They were desperate to get out, but in their panic, kept themselves and others from escaping. Your heart is that desperate to be wicked. You aren't just prone to sin or just an imperfect person who does his or her best in life. You aren't trying to do your best by making a few mistakes along the way with the best of intentions. No, your heart wants so badly to do what it knows to be wrong. It takes a great deal of socialization, fear of public humiliation, and a desire for approval from others to keep you from winding up on death row or being a permanent resident of the rescue mission if you haven't trusted Christ. Admit it. You've been angry without a cause. You've sought your own, not just what you wanted, regardless of anyone else's feelings. You've lied, cheated, stolen, and committed sexual morality, at least in your thoughts, the spirit of your mind, all the while justifying it by some misunderstanding or unmet need. You've murdered people in your heart, hated them and wanted them to die. I'm not talking about telling the proverbial little white lie or stealing some paper clips from work so I can make some kind of trendy argument to get you to admit something you don't really believe about yourself. I'm talking about what you and I really are like. I had a customer in housing sales once who told me an interesting story. He was a good guy, a little abrasive, but a skilled craftsman who loved his wife and family. He was just pure Baltimore, if you know what I mean. He had heart problems. Once in an unnamed hospital in Baltimore, he died on the operating table and had to be revived. He became conscious, cursing and screaming and talking about fire and a hell he didn't believe in. When he was able, able to, he apologized to the nursing staff for his language. They shrugged it off. A nurse told him they'd experienced that even with sweet little old ladies at the end of their, end of their lives. He thought, it was, he thought it was funny and dismissed my efforts to suggest it was real. Think of someone you know, and it may be a relative, even a sweet little old lady, your mother maybe, who is a vile, believe it or not, wicked, nasty sinner by nature, who cannot enter into the presence of God without Christ's sacrifice and resurrection. Until most people can wrap their minds around that, they will just look at you like a cow looks at a new gate when you speak of the need for salvation and God's forgiveness. Good people are hard to convince that they are not good people. They have the testimony of their hearts their friends and family, their accomplishments, their material success, and yes, the testimony of their own seared and twisted conscience. They've got to be made to understand that they're not being compared to other lesser mortals. They are being compared to Christ. In comparison to a sinless, righteous, perfectly moral, and obedient man to God, who happened to be God in the flesh at the same time he was fully a man, 
where would this good person you're talking to stand? Imagine that. This good guy or good girl is being compared to God. They are lost without his righteousness as theirs does not and cannot measure up. Do you know that human beings killed 100 million of their own in the 20th century and displaced millions more? Murder, rape, which is unfinished murder, abuse, torture, neglect, vile perversions are part and parcel of humanity. Do you honestly think people are basically good? Jesus even said to his own followers, Matthew 7, 11, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Considering that shocking information, what has God promised in that psalm the Holy Spirit gave David by inspiration, wisdom, and understanding? Verse 8 of that psalm I read, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. God is so merciful. On this earth, God shows mercy to the most unrighteous and vile people you can imagine. Matthew 5, 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Luke 6, 35. But love your enemies. Love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. It is God's character to show mercy. He delights in it. Micah seven eighteen. Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. Psalm 103, 9. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. God doesn't hold grudges for a person who is repentant. He's not going to hold your sin over your head for the rest of your life. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even our most secret thoughts, even things hidden in full from ourselves. Psalm 19, 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Psalm 103, 10 and 11. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. God's mercy is such that he rarely gives us what we deserve. That is one fundamental definition of grace, undeserved, unmerited mercy. The mercy of God is sufficient for the pardon of the greatest sins, as for the least, for the greatest sins, as for the least, and that because his mercy is infinite. That which is infinite is as much above what is great as it is above what is small. Thus God being infinitely great, he is as much above kings as he is above beggars. He is as much above the person trying, always trying to do his best as he is above the lowest sinner. One finite measure does not come any nearer to the extent of what is infinite than another. So the mercy of God being infinite, it must be as sufficient for the pardon of all sin as of one. If one of the least sins is not beyond the mercy of God, so neither are the greatest or 10,000 of them. And I'm paraphrasing Jonathan Edwards in a famous sermon from the colonial era. So, if that is so, if you can accept what the Bible has said about that subject and what I've pointed out here, why are you still holding over your head, your own head, the sins that God has forgiven you for? He said, Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far he removed our transgressions from us. I know how some of you in the middle of the night, how you are and your thoughts as you lay awake, especially as older people who've done much to regret. Now, I'm, not, I'm not talking to those of you who think they've been just wonderful people their entire lives, or those who think that if they've done wrong, it was someone else who made them do it. I'm talking to those of you who remember what you said, what you did, what you thought, and cringe when it comes to your memory. A sin is a transgression of God's standard of righteousness. 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. God has removed these transgressions if you have sincerely confessed them to him, as it is written, as far as the east is from the west. They're gone. They were placed on Jesus Christ at the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Who brings it to your memory? Do you think God does that? Is it your spirit? Your spirit? Or another spirit. Maybe you've got some unresolved issues regarding your sin. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, 
and there remembers that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there the gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. What if you can't reconcile with someone you've wronged? Maybe they're dead. Maybe they don't, maybe they don't even know. Maybe they refuse to forgive you anyway. What are you going to do about those situations? You have to trust God. There is no other option left open for you. You can't make up for your sin against someone who can't receive your repentance, isn't even aware of your sin, or refuses to accept peace between you and them. You need to accept God's peace, peace with him. You must not reject his forgiveness. In other words, at some point, we have to acknowledge that God has forgiven us and removed our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. They're gone. Sometimes it's not what you did, but what you didn't do that possesses you. Romans 7, 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. James 4, 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Those of us who've had children go astray fret about what we did wrong. And yet, what if you simply did what you knew to do, what you believe was right, and things still didn't turn out the way you think they should? You know your children are like arrows you shoot from a bow. Once they fly, they are beyond your control. You hope, you pray to have sent them in the right direction toward the target. But the wind, the firmness of the arrow, the fletching, other things play a part, and that's so much so that you can only do your best. They are independent agents and under God's care. For those of us who did not do all we knew or should have known, there comes a time we must accept God's forgiveness in this too. Why are some of you who have been forgiven so filled with self-hate, self-doubt, and self-contempt? If Christ's sacrifice on the cross at Calvary is sufficient for the creator of the universe, then why is it not sufficient for you? I ask you again, who brings it to your memory? Do you think God does that? Is it your spirit or another spirit? Discouragement is a tool of Satan. He uses it well and his ministers also are adept at its uses. Remember when Paul was dealing with a man in the Corinthian church who committed a grievous sin and was apparently finally, finally repentant? He asked for the church to forgive the offender. 2 Corinthians 2, 6 to 11. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So that contrary rise, contrary rise, you ought to rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Discouragement is a twin to bitterness, and Paul specifically warned men about feeling this toward their wives. Colossians 3.19 Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. The following is said in the context of the wicked, which we can apply to Satan, but also applies in the way we treat each other, we can treat each other, when we have the wrong attitude and are doing Satan's bidding unknowingly. Psalm 64.3 Who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. Has your faith been hurt by bitter words spoken like a sharp arrow that penetrates your heart? Are you guilty of doing that to someone else? Perhaps if you, feel, if you feel a sharp word coming on, you best be quiet lest you do his work for him. So if Satan wants to discourage us, what better way than to have us reject God's forgiveness and replace it with our own wrath on our unworthiness? How clever he is. He might even use your husband or wife or dear friend to do his work. Satan brings to mind sins long forgiven, and as people you know and love sometimes, throw them into your face. What God has forgotten, let not man bring into remembrance. Forgiveness is, doesn't mean you won't have consequences for your sins that will continue to plague you for a lifetime. Years of heavy drinking and smoking can take their toll even after you receive Christ. A lifetime of verbally and physically abusing your wife and children is not going to be forgotten just because you got, quote, saved. I know of a preacher whose first wife left him because when he got saved, he thought because God forgave him, she should too. And he confessed adulteries against her he made before he was saved, which she didn't know about. She didn't agree with his argument that she must forgive him as Christ had done. Sometimes you have to show repentance and a changed attitude in life for years before a person whom you've hurt 
can ever trust you, and some relationships never completely heal. Patience, Christian. We're dealing with eternal things here, and those few years are but a blip in time. When a husband abuses his wife, or a wife abuses her husband doing the work of Satan, they will typically make the victim feel unworthy of forgiveness. In fact, sometimes the reason a spouse stays with an abuser is because the abuser has convinced them that the abuse is their fault. They are unworthy or don't support the spouse enough, don't satisfy their needs, or just fall short in some way. The victim becomes the guilty party until or unless they realize that God can and has forgiven them for what they've done, if anything, and most likely they realize the other person is just manipulating them and their complaints are unfair or simply unjustified. <coughs> Excuse me. Some preachers control their congregations by constantly making them feel unforgiven. Just a big disappointment to God. These ministers of Satan will constantly harangue their congregation that they used to be on fire for God, but have grown cold. They will have them constantly looking back and doubting their faith. They won't tell them that their best times with God are now and in the future. They will misuse revival and blame the fact that the church isn't bursting at the seams with new born again Christians because their congregation, no matter how close a relationship each of them has with our Savior, well, they're cold dead in a hammer. You're never good enough for them or God. You're almost worse than you were before you received Christ. And then there were those, like perhaps some of you, who simply will not accept God's forgiveness. Doesn't that strike you as kind of blasphemous? His death, burial, and resurrection are not sufficient for you? Really? Just imagine, if you will, a young woman raised on a culture of television, movies, and the internet, with no other values imparted to her than what is found there. She winds up having two abortions. Her only sense of self-worth came from how well she attracted male attention with her dress and manner. That was her, quote, power and self-esteem. So she followed her heart, as our pop culture likes to talk about, and wound up in an abortion clinic twice. For years after, in spite of what society was telling her, that she did the noble and the right thing, the thing that was good for her, she felt awful. She was filled with contempt for herself and even outright disgust. She couldn't understand why, how, why, but she often wondered how her children would have been. What would those babies have been like? She saw mothers loving their babies and their babies laughing and giving them sloppy kisses. She was sickly drawn to watching YouTube videos of laughing babies, cute babies, and just felt miserable. One day, she was invited by a concerned friend at work to a church. It just so happened, as it often does, that the sermon seemed like it was prepared just for her. God's great love and forgiveness was talked about. She felt her heart swell as she wanted so badly to feel that love and forgiveness. She went down to the front and tearfully pleaded for Christ to enter her heart and take over her life. But she never darkened the door of a church again. You see, it was one thing for God to forgive her, but she could not accept God's forgiveness and forgive herself for the harm that she had done to herself and to her little babies. Her life spiraled out of control in an orgy of self-hatred, drugs, and alcohol. Can you imagine how, for the woman of this parable, how tragic that would be? Can you picture the sorrow and anguish? You say it couldn't happen that way. I say it's happened a million times. Just imagine a young man, full of hope and expectations of life, learning a trade and meeting a girl, maybe his high school sweetheart, then getting married. Children come in a house and a home, which are two different things, of course. And life looks like it's going to be a joyful thing. He was never raised with religion, but his parents were good people. But then under the stress of the burdens of being a provider, he took to the occasional drink. Unbeknownst to him, he was one of those unfortunate people who find that in their case, one drink is too many and a dozen aren't enough. He begins to descend in the abyss of alcoholism. Meaningless adultery followed as it often does like a scavenger looking to pick up a scrap of meal. And his wife left him for both his drunkenness and his affair. He took his, she took his kids and his home, and he lost his job. Finally, in our parable, he wound up in a rescue mission. He heard sound preaching on the salvation of God and the love of God, on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary and of the empty tomb. He heard about eternal life with God, and he came forward in tears, pitiful and sorrowful for all he'd done. But when the dust cleared, and he had time to think. The nightmare still haunted him, and in the regret at losing his high school sweetheart, the mother of his children, then being consigned to always being an outsider in their lives, racked his tortured soul. 
Now you say, these examples you made up are too extreme. That usually doesn't happen that way. Well, if that's true, but if you can see the folly of those two pathetic people whose lives are ruined by guilt and regret, can you not see that you, who haven't done anything like what they did, cannot keep regarding God's forgiveness as insufficient and be of any use to God except to serve as an example of a bitter Christian? I'm not saying you shouldn't be ashamed of what you've done. I'm not saying you shouldn't try to make up for what you've done to others when that doesn't cause more damage than the first sin. I'm saying that if you've asked God for forgiveness and you are leading a changed life and you are, when possible, making up for what you've done, then let go of the self-disgust and the self-contempt. Move forward in Christ's mercy. Serve him with joy in your heart and a song on your lips. Stop sulking. Stop hanging your head and wishing you could just hide. Our God can do great things with anyone. Any sinner, no matter how wicked they've been, can be of service to God if they truly repent of their sins, ask for forgiveness, and forge ahead in God's care. Christ loves you, Christian. The creator of the universe, building a constellation in the furthest reaches of space, making life happen in a mountain jungle no man will ever see in this life, making hundreds of billions of hearts beat, overseeing the life and death struggle of countless animals and people, sent his Holy Spirit, the very mind of God, to draw you to him. He wanted to spend an eternity with you and you with him. Remember what Paul said, Philippians 3, 13 and 14, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You can't run a race looking backwards over your shoulder any more than you can run it paying attention to what someone else is doing in their lane. In a different context, Jesus made a point that we should consider in this context, Luke 9, 62. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. One of the fruits of the spirit of God having it indwelling you is joy. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, temperance. Against such there is no law. If joy is always beyond your reach, that is not evidence of Christ in you, but of something or someone else oppressing you. Isaiah wrote Isaiah 26, 3, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Does your lack of peace suggest a lack of trust in God? Okay, let's sum it up. You should feel shame for your sins against God and against others. You should feel regret and sorrow. You should try to make up to others for what you've done to them. And you should be willing to live a changed life for as long as it takes to show them your seriousness about your repentance if possible. But you should also bring your sins to the cross and lay them at Christ's feet and let him remove them as far as the east is from the west. And then, as Christ said to the woman accused of adultery, when he asked her where her accusers were, and if any man was left to condemn her. John 8, 11, she said, No man, Lord, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. When David came seeking forgiveness from God for his egregious sins, he pled not the smallness of them, but the greatness of them. Psalm 25, 11. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. And he appealed to God for God's name's sake, for mercy as an attribute of God, part of his character. You don't go to the emergency room because you feel a little unwell. You appeal to the doctor because your sickness is great, even frightening but at least painfully unpleasant. And the great physician heals you. His mercy is sufficient. The cross and the empty tomb attest to this. You receive Christ as your savior. Now receive his forgiveness and move forward in his glorious light. Look forward, run your race toward the finish line and quit looking back over your shoulder. Um, and I, anything that I preach or teach impacts me. Uh, it, it, it starts with me realizing a deficiency in myself. And I just hope that what I've said will help somebody today. And uh, I wish you the very best. God bless you.